Hello. Um, I'm wearing a hat because I've changed my hair for a, an acting role and I want it to be a surprise. Um, in this video, I'm going to talk about cognitive problems that I have personal experience of. Um, because I've done a few videos on cognition recently um, and it's, I think it's always interesting to have an inside kind of phenomenological perspective on these things. And when I was worried about the cognitive problems I was experiencing, I thought that I must have something like multiple sclerosis. I watched a lot of videos of people uh, describing their process of getting diagnosed, partly because I wanted to see if it resembled my own experience. But, but the, I suppose the other side of that is when you think a lot about cognition and you start having cognitive problems, it becomes hard to work out what you know, what percentage of your problems are just psychosomatic and what percentage are, um, I suppose, real problems. Um, so I suppose the, the fact that I've, that I've thought a lot about these experiences has a trade-off of some of them might have been influenced by psychosomatic factors. Um, but I, I don't know, I don't think it's possible to avoid that altogether. Um, in September of 2022, I started a Cognitive Neuroscience Masters, um, which I, I think I only managed to get onto because I had this YouTube channel on linguistics, because linguistics is a more normal way into neuroscience. Um, but other than that, I just had an archaeology degree, which, which isn't normally um, a very good way of getting into neuroscience. But I managed to get in. And we did various case studies where we watched footage of people with different neurological conditions being examined and in these examinations they'll be presented with different tasks um, and tested on their ability to, to do the tasks and depending on what part of the brain isn't working very well people will have uh, sometimes a surprising level of difficulty doing certain tasks. Um, as we did these case studies and as we went through the course I started to notice that I was developing neurological symptoms, which I at first just assumed must be psychosomatic. So it, at first it was things like I got an intention tremor. So it, it's a tremor that's triggered by action. So when my hand was going to pick up something, it would shake and I'd have to hold mugs and glasses with two hands um, because my hands were shaking. And then when I put the object down and retracted my hand, it would calm down and it would stop tremoring. Um, I also noticed that whereas before I was just able to, with a mug like this, I was just able to, I don't know if you can see the table, but I was able to put it down and just take my hand away. I now found that when I tried to do that, I would often pull the mug off the table and it would fall on the floor. And I realized it was because the coordination of the unhooking my fingers and taking my hand away from the mug were no longer coupled with each other properly and so I would retract my hand without my fingers being uncurled and the, the mug would come off. And there were all sorts of things like that. I found myself bumping into objects more often than normal, um, just general coordination problems. Um, I speak a lot when I'm doing YouTube videos, even if I'm not filming myself I'll speak into my phone a lot. Um, and I, I noticed that at the it, it wouldn't really affect social situations, but when I made a video, uh, before the symptoms came on, I would just be able to speak the whole way through the video and it would be fine. But after the symptoms started, I found that I would find it hard to speak fairly soon into the recording. And I would, I would make a lot more speech errors and I would have to speak a lot more slowly, um, especially if I was reading a script. Um, so... I um, I, I also found this with the Beowulf series that me and Jackson Crawford were doing, um, are still doing. I think um, I need to I need to sort that out with him at some point because I've been very lax on that. But um, I found that especially reading old English, I really struggled at certain points to to get anything out when I would normally find it fairly easy. Um, I, I had some issues swallowing, um, I would choke on things more often and it would be sometimes quite alarming. 
<coughs> and so eventually I think I went to see a doctor uh, and I also had issues concentrating on things I really couldn't concentrate on anything um, or, or sometimes I just have massive lapses in understanding where it, it was almost like um, lag in a computer game except my my senses were still running as usual my vision was still running as usual you know normal smoothness and everything but my understanding was lagging behind my vision so if somebody was walking towards me and walking past me the sight of them going past me would be normal but somehow my understanding of where they were in space would go j -j 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 and lag in that way and it's very hard to describe because you would think that the vision and the understanding would be coupled with each other but for me they became decoupled so that my understanding of the situation was uh, was split apart from my vision and that would sometimes be kind of dangerous um, in situations where I was crossing roads for example I would look both ways but when I looked left because the whole content of my visual field was changing as I moved my head left I would see everything but it would take me a second or two which is quite a long time in cognitive terms a second or two to work out whether there was a car coming and then when I moved my head back to the the other side the left again it would take me a second or two to work out whether there was a car coming and I would feel the cognitive effort actually tiring me out and almost hurting physically hurting my head um, just just from the the metabolic effort of, of understanding what I'm looking at um, so I I got concerned about this and I went to a doctor um, and I said I've got a family history of multiple sclerosis I'm worried this might be that um, and the doctor said it does sound a bit concerning it doesn't exactly sound like multiple sclerosis but it's definitely worth coming back uh, if they get any worse so I, I went away and I, I felt the doctor had, had been very um, fair and I went away and then I started to develop um, problems walking um, I found that I got very exhausted when I walked any distance outside of my own house um, and it was a the kind of exhaustion that I, I wonder if it's the same kind of thing as you might get if you have chronic fatigue syndrome or something like that because <clears throat> it felt very different from being sleepy or um, anything like that it felt like um, almost like painful I felt almost so tired that I wouldn't be able to sleep because I was too tired like my almost like I was about ready to die like my body was ready to pack in um, and in this state of exhaustion I couldn't walk properly at all I would be sometimes I would be really seriously struggling to stay standing because my balance was so bad um, I would fall over in the house a lot I would have to hold myself up on the walls after a while um, and I have I have a bit of a walking stick collection um, because I used to like the god unbelievable I had a bit of a walking stick collection because I used to uh, co collect them, I used to like them. And I started using one of the walking sticks to walk around just to test whether it would do anything. And, and when you're doing that, you should really see a physiotherapist um, and to check that it's not going to give you like carpal tunnel syndrome or something. But I, not very sensibly, I managed to pick one that didn't give me carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, And let me just check the camera's still recording. Oh, battery's running out. So before we go on, I filmed a half hour follow up to that clip where because the clip was completely white at the end, I changed the exposure settings slightly and the one I recorded started a completely normal fine exposure and then went down 
to such low the light was so low that this half of my face was pitch black with no recoverable detail at all so I'm shooting in raw now so hopefully I can adjust anything that happens uh, like that um, but that's what you get for filming in English weather in ProRes I suppose but um, where was I <laughs> before the last recording that I did that was um, rendered unusable by the weather um, I think I was talking about the walking stick so I got a walking stick that didn't give me um, carpal tunnel um, and that helped a lot I, I had to walk around 8 miles a day to get to and from UCL and I, I felt all of a sudden as if I could just walk normally basically I remember thinking it feels almost normal um, and I think what I had was cerebellar ataxia um, and this is common in reasonably common in the condition that I turned out to have which was celiac disease and it basically means that your cerebellum the part of your brain that would normally control things like coordination and balance isn't working properly and so from what I gather and correct me if you know more about this from what I gather um, the cerebellum would normally be taking in sensory information and using that to coordinate muscle movements for example when you're walking along all sorts of tiny little muscle contractions have to happen to keep you stable and upright because you know you're very tall and very thin so you're kind of fundamentally unstable so lots of little mus mu muscle contractions are necessary to keep you upright the cerebellum deals with that and when the, cere uh, when the cerebellum breaks for some reason uh, it can't do that anymore and so your brain has to look for other usually quite inefficient ways of keeping you upright and so walking can be very exhausting and you lose the ability to balance properly very quickly and although I initially felt a big improvement from using the walking stick eventually it became still quite difficult to walk even with the stick and next to impossible to walk any kind of distance without the stick so there were times that even with the stick I was walking back from UCL and I was a mile or two into the walk and I had to ring someone up for moral support because I just needed that extra push because I, I was crying, I was in tears I could not walk forwards in a straight line I was just like stumbling like like somebody who was blackout drunk basically um, incidentally I think a lot of the stumbling when you're drunk is from cerebellar damage um, which is the same kind of brain damage that I, I had at the time um, so I really really struggled to walk um, I went to see the doctor he sort of sprung into action and said we'll refer you to a neurologist but we first need to do a, a few blood tests to confirm that it's not a kind of vitamin deficiency because otherwise the neurologist won't accept the referral so we did blood tests it turned out to be folate deficiency um, vitamin B9 deficiency which was a relief because it meant that I didn't have MS um, and there were a few possibilities about what might have caused the folate deficiency and one of those was celiac disease and I have a family history of celiac disease basically it means that you're intolerant to gluten which is a protein that's found in bread and wheat products and barley products and in a smallish not not a tiny percentage of cases but a smallish percentage of cases it results in central nervous system symptoms because basically your immune system has a bad reaction to the gluten and it stops your digestive system from properly absorbing certain vitamins and in my case that was vitamin B9 and of course you need vitamins to maintain your body and in the case of vitamin B9 you need it to um, maintain your central nervous system and to produce blood cells that work properly red blood cells that work properly um, so as much as I know there's a contingent of people that just kind of stick their noses up at any any kind of intolerance to food food is how you make your body and if if your body won't absorb the food properly your body doesn't get maintained properly obviously that can result in central nervous system problems so um, it was a relief I got put on some supplements which helped a little bit but as soon as I came off them it got worse again and so I'm, I'm a little way down the pipeline now of being diagnosed with celiac disease. I haven't been 100% formally diagnosed yet. Um, I won't be until I get an endoscopy in a few weeks. But uh, 
my GP and the gastro doctor are pretty certain that that's what it is and it's just a formality to confirm that I have it. So I'm on gluten at the moment because if I, if I came off gluten, all of the lesions in my digestive system would correct themselves and then the endoscopy would come back negative and I'd get a false negative. Um, so to, to be properly diagnosed, I have to gluten myself for a little while. Um, but yeah, in, in, the, in the sort of long walk to getting diagnosed, I had various um, problems with thinking and with cognition that arose after I pretty much understood what the problem was. So some of those were with perceptual judgments. So let's say that there were a set of things in front of me on the kitchen sideboard or something that I had to choose. You know, I had to, you know, maybe there were six cans in front of me and I had to choose the one that had marrow fat peas in it or something. I could look at each one of them in turn and I would have to think about it for seconds on end. Is this the one I want? No. Is this the one I want? No. And I, it, it took me that long to make basic perceptual judgments sometimes. Um, there were cases where, it, in, in more extreme cases, there were situations where I would be having a conversation with someone and then I would realize I didn't know what the conversation was about. Um, I might be having a light-hearted debate with a friend or something and then I would realize that I didn't understand what point of view I was defending or why they thought that I thought a certain thing. I, it was almost if I'd, as if I'd kind of talked up to that point as a zombie and I almost like my consciousness was just being introduced and I didn't I didn't know what I'd said or I didn't know why I'd said what I'd said almost as if I'd been doing things on autopilot and then forgotten what they were um, in, in very extreme situations I would look at people that I knew that I should know and I wouldn't 100% know who I was talking to. I wouldn't be completely consciously aware of who it was. And that would even happen with my partner or with close friends. I would, I would know that they were in my close social circle, but I wouldn't know which person they were. Um, and that, that could last seconds on end. I could be talking to someone and not completely know who they were or what my responsibilities to them were or, you know, it was almost like my conscious brain just didn't have access to a lot of data that it should have access to. Um, and knowing it was folate deficiency meant that I knew that it probably wouldn't get that bad. It can cause dementia if you're quite old, but in my 20s it was unlikely to get very severe. Um, but yeah, it, it was quite difficult at times and I, I found myself getting very bad at keeping track of what I'd agreed to do for people um, what my what my commitments were and at, you know when I was very deep in it and I was almost used to having these problems I almost couldn't believe the amount of stuff that people expected me to do um, it's very hard to explain to people I just can't do that much stuff I can't keep in mind I'm not going to be able to remember to do that next Wednesday and I'm not going to reply I'm not going to remember to reply to your message very quickly and I'm not you know stuff that a lot of people would consider basic courtesy I could not there was no way that I could do it it it, it was like asking me to solve you know some some ancient maths equation I, I there was absolutely no way I would be able to do it but because it was something that everybody else would find easy. It, it was very hard to explain to people, I can't, there's no way I'm gonna be able to do that. Um, and so I overcommitted myself to a lot of things and then became very, very exhausted um, in a way that I'm still kind of, I think it should, a lot of the problems with cognition should go away when I stop eating gluten again. But other things were with, with the walking stick. Um, I feel guilty for only realizing this um, after I started using the walking stick, but you, you, um, you know, if you can't stand up at all without leaning on something, you shouldn't be using a walking stick, you should be in a wheelchair. And even so, some people who use wheelchairs can stand up for a short period of time. So 
me, you know, using a walking stick is something you should do when you have balance problems or some problems standing, but not very, very severe problems. But it felt almost like if I was carrying this, almost this marker that I was disabled, I had to, I almost felt this pressure to act more disabled than I was. Um, because I thought that if I stopped relying on the walking stick for five minutes or I left it in the corner of the room and went to do something, I almost felt like people would look at me and judge me like, oh, you don't really need the walking stick. Whereas the reality is I wouldn't be able to do a quarter of the stuff I did if I didn't have the stick because it saved me so much energy on the commute. Uh, it helped me get around if I did have a funny turn. Um, but I don't know. I, I felt almost as if there was a... I don't think most people reacted in this way, but I, I don't know. I felt I felt slightly judged sometimes, especially on the tube and situations where I didn't know people. Um, and another thing was that when I when I walked into supermarkets and things, I got, um, you know, I think I, I learned what it is to experience sensory overload because previously in supermarkets. It, it wasn't a problem, it was just like walking around my own house. It was like, obviously I'm not gonna bump into anyone because why, why would I, you know, I can just walk away from, you know, walk around them. But all of a sudden having so many people to keep track of in my visual field was, was almost painful. It was so overwhelming and I could feel my brain slowing down like a computer that's been asked to do too much at once. Um, and if I approached if there were too many people down an aisle, I would just turn and walk away because I couldn't deal with keeping track of all of their, all of them at once and all of their movements. And I knew, especially if I didn't have the walking stick, I knew that people wouldn't have a speck of sympathy for me and they wouldn't try to avoid me. And you know, why would they? Because I was just a normal person. Um, they could just walk into me and bump into me. And if, if somebody bumped into me, I would fall over. There was no way I was staying upright if someone bumped into me. So I, and in, an, in another sense, the walking stick helped me at the supermarket because it kind of signaled to people, walk around me, <laughs> don't, don't, don't brush past me and don't walk into me. Um, but some people still did, but most people were pretty, pretty 95% of people were quite, quite respectful, um, which I know isn't everyone's experience, but... Um, yeah, that sense of sensory overload was really very difficult to manage when it when it started coming on, and um, other things like that. There were social problems where, in in social situations, I suddenly like my hearing's always been quite bad, but all of a sudden my brain wasn't compensating for it very well anymore. So if somebody said something to me, it sometimes took me three seconds to work out what they said and form a response. So it was very hard to meet new people because they. I couldn't really hold a conversation very well. Um, and I talked to a, a friend about this who has autism and the friend said that I was basically getting the autistic experience, which is very, it's sort of another thing that I, I felt bad that I never thought too much about because if I had to live like that all the time, I don't, I don't know how I'd cope with it. I have a lot more respect for people who have to deal with things like sensory overload now, because um, it truly is, <clears throat> truly is very unpleasant even just having dipped my toe in the en the edge of it um, but um, there are other things as well there were there were occasional hallucinations um, which were normally just misdiagnosing what objects were so there was one time when I saw a dead mouse on the floor of the kitchen and I thought that shouldn't be a dead mouse there we don't have any you know killing traps, we have the odd counterweight trap for them to you know, keep them alive and then let them go, but we don't, there shouldn't be any snappy traps set, why would there be a dead mouse? And it took me leaning over and looking at it for a few seconds to realise that it was just the metal head of a hammer. <coughs> and I remember when I thought it was a mouse, I remember it had a tail and it had feet and everything, but of course, of course, the hammer didn't have feet, didn't have a tail. And it's very weird to remember, because there wasn't, there wasn't a, a moment where it morphed into a hammer. 
it's just it's almost like my brain just resolved what it really was and even though I could remember it looking like a mouse and now it looked like a hammer there didn't seem to be a point of it morphing it was just my brain worked out what the truth was um, and the same thing happened a couple of times where there was a bit, big bit of wood in the um, in on the pavement which I thought was a giant wood louse and I thought wood lice can't be that big so I leaned over and it was just a piece of wood and it the kind of perceptual the kind of misperception that that I think everybody gets occasionally but just on a on a larger scale um, and yeah th those things just happened a lot basically and then there was a point um, where my dad died in the midst of all of this um, he'd been an alcoholic for about f five or six years there was just lightning there um, I know the okay ominous ominous <laughs> prophetic p pathet pathetic fallacy I th is that what they call that anyway um, I'm, I'm really another thing when I'm on the gluten is I'm very bad at broadcasting my emotions and I feel like I seem like a robot or like I don't know I feel like I'm not talking as naturally like as like I don't know but my dad died um, at some stage um, from what, what he would have called alcoholism I know that that's kind of a stigmatized term <coughs> uh, it, it was a combination of alcohol uh, excessive alcohol consumption and also what turned out to be pancreatic cancer um, I was around once and he came back with some shopping and then he collapsed and started having seizures and then we got him into hospital and he um, he was he was in hospital for about a week and then eventually after it all looked like it might be okay he had a gastrointestinal hemorrhage in the pancreas and then um, just his body gave up basically and it was a very emotionally unpleasant experience I think it, it was kind of offset by the fact that um, he had a very calm attitude to death and my mum had died 10 years earlier so we talked me and him had talked about it quite a lot and we, we talked quite a lot about everything he was a very calming presence when I had problems he was the person that I went to to, to talk it through and calm, calm, me, uh, calm myself down and we both had this kind of understanding that death just happens at some point and you can't really control it um, we're not really entitled to any life at all and so we're lucky for everything we get and and it was quite heartening to see that even when he was fairly sure he was going to die in the next few days he was still very calm never seemed emotionally bothered by it at all never cried not that not that it's wrong to cry or anything like that but it, it made me feel like my attitude to death is not suddenly going to collapse when I know that I'm going to die and I feel like I will I will be comfortable and I'll, I'll, I'll understand that it's natural um, again there's a hundred healthy ways of dealing with death and I'm not saying that's the only one but what I mean is that there were a lot of emotional things around it which were fairly easy to deal with and then there were there were some more difficult things like the fact that it was a visually quite disturbing death it was he was in the intensive care unit and he had a breathing mask on he had very bad jaundice where your face is very very yellow um, his eyes were defocused and pointing in different directions and he was kind of gasping for air and writhing around in pain it was very very visually unpleasant um, and <coughs> it, it, was, it was yeah I suppose that that aspect of it was was a bit disturbing and I had some dreams after that where I sort of dreamt that I was sitting up in bed talking to my girlfriend and then I turned around and she was having a seizure um, but those those dreams went away pretty quickly but I found the stress of having to deal with paperwork and stuff like that and also the the inability to talk to him about my problems because he was the person I would normally talk to I found those things to be very unpleasant and I think the folate deficiency probably made the, um, the, the emotional management quite difficult as well. Um, 
because I, when I was a, a teenager, I had a lot of anger management problems, which I initially took out on other people. Um, spent my teenage years getting therapy and trying to work out ways of avoiding taking out on other people because I was scared I would become an abusive adult. Um, haven't become an abusive adult, I'm, I'm happy to say. Um, but I do often have internal anger, which is quite painful. Um, that's something I'm still working out. And that became quite bad um, after Dad died. I, I found myself, whenever, whenever I was alone, I was angry on some level with some aspect of the world. Um, and <coughs> a lot of things went wrong after he died. Just coincidentally, a lot of appliances broke down and needed replacing and we had to spend money that, you know, we didn't really, we couldn't really afford to spend. And we're, we were in the very fortunate position that our family helped us with some of those payments. Um, and, um, but just the, the sheer sequence of things going wrong, I think my brain went down a very negative interpretation of those. And the camera ran out, so I'm doing it the following day. Um, I had, as all of these bad things started happening, I think I, I had a, a strong negativity bias in my brain and it started going down some quite weird rabbit holes that became a bit disturbing. Um, <clears throat> and I think that, that the basis of it all was that I, I, I just started to wonder if someone might be doing it deliberately. Um, and I, I went into maybe, uh, well, I, I definitely had some kind of unrealistic delusions, but I, I was still within the realm of realizing that they were, would be considered unrealistic by most people. So I started wondering if is it possible that someone I know has done this? Is it possible that someone in my family or one of my friends has killed my dad and is now breaking all of my things? And I, 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 I went through at least a day of being quite scared of the, the, the real possibility of this and realizing on the one hand that if I said this to everyone, it would seem really, you know, unbelievable. And I would seem like I, I had psychosis or something, which may be Maybe my, my head was poking into the low end of psychosis. I don't actually know what the diagnostic criteria are. I know that people, bereaved people, can sort of poke into it slightly. Um, and so I, I, I thought my way out of it and I just thought, okay, I can pretend I don't think these things and hope they go away. And they did go away. And I, I had a couple of moments when certain things would trigger this 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 weird sensation that some spirit like I, I think I thought it was the devil or something like that I, I felt like some some spirit in the universe or someone controlling the simulation or some some higher I don't know some higher consciousness had been making all of these bad things happen and I think it was it was my way of rationalizing the fact that from my perspective a really unrealistic number of bad things had happened in very close succession um, and in my head I just needed some way of explaining it because this kind of um, the sheer unfortunateness of all of it and and also the fact that it was happening to me not not to say that I don't deserve to have bad things happen to me but just the fact that I you know, s two parents dying before you're in your mid-twenties and in pretty horrible circumstances. I, d I don't know anyone else in person that that's happened to, I don't think. Um, and so, obviously, in, in other parts of the world, that's, that's a fairly normal thing to happen and it's a lot more common. Um, but that in, in, in this adult state, my brain wasn't thinking like that. It was just thinking... I'm so unfortunate, how could all this have happened to me? There must be something, you know, I don't know. I, I didn't think cursed, but I, I just started thinking weird things. My brain started thinking there must be something I don't understand at play here because otherwise all of these bad things wouldn't have happened at once. And um, I eventually, um, th those feelings subsided, but they were kind of powerful for at least two or three days disconnected from each other I had I had this very weird sense that maybe reality wasn't what I thought it was um, 
and um, sorry, that's so distracting. Um, Yeah, and then when I reflected on it, I realized that I had been being very, very negative because obviously I have lots of good things. I have a YouTube channel where I can be fairly sure that, you know, a certain number of people will watch whatever I put up, at least for the time being. And that's something a lot of people would cut off their arm for. Um, I have, you know, reasonable financial security. Uh, I have uh, lots of close friends who I who I get to see fairly often. Um, yeah, I, I, I recognised that I was being very negative and also a lot of the appliances that had broken, it made sense that they'd broken. They were about the right age to break. Uh, it just so happened that they all reached the end of their natural lifespan at the same time. And, and now I'm in a position where that's pushed me to get uh, replacements for them. And now I probably won't have to worry about anything very major going wrong for a while that you know you've got to be cautious thinking things like that because you could always be wrong but um, I no longer have to worry about my dad dying which I did a lot um, I, I, I didn't necessarily worry about on a deep existential level about it but I I think I worried about coming in and finding him dead in his chair or something because he he was so um, especially in the evenings he drank so much that you, you wouldn't have been able to tell if he had cancer or something and indeed we, di we turned out that he did have cancer and we couldn't tell um, and, and in, in a perverse way I don't have to worry about that anymore because he has died um, so there's this there's this slightly guilt inducing relief of not not having to yeah any worry about him has gone now I did wonder about if I do make this video, how much do I talk about the sad things that have happened? And I think they're so linked into everything that it it would have been kind of silly not to. Um, uh, I I I had a thought. Uh, I had a few thoughts about how to end it. One of the things I was going to say was I, I had intended to make this video a few months earlier. Um, while a lot of the bad things were still going on, now I feel like they're mostly subsided. Um, <clears throat> but when I when I thought about making it in the middle of all the bad things, I thought that would be quite a nice video. If anyone's going through something bad, they can look at somebody else who's going through something bad and kind of feel some kind of connection with them that's in from the moment rather than just from in, from hindsight, because it's easy to talk about things in hindsight. Um, and <clears throat> I, I didn't end up doing that because I think I was sort of umming and ahhing about whether whether it's you know appropriate to put something like this on the channel. I don't see why not. Ultimately, people can, it, as long as I put a warning at the start that it's a bit depressing, people can avoid it if they want to. Um, but I felt all all kinds of points of connection with people, um, and I, I felt. A lot of points of connection with my dad over the last few months I started off thinking ironically the one person who well one of the few people who shares my attitude to death has now died so I can't talk to him about it and everybody else seems to have what what seems to me to be a very kind of manic attitude to death which I I don't understand or identify with and none of them really knew him very well and they're all not not none of them but a lot of people didn't didn't know him very well and they're assuming things about him and it, it sort of hurts um, but I, I still feel connected to him because as mum died years earlier we we'd had a lot of conversations about our attitudes to death and our responses to death and he'd sometimes expressed that he, he flip-flopped between being quite glad that he doesn't react very you know dramatically to death uh, and and feeling a bit guilty that he didn't react very dramatically to death and that surprised me when I first heard it because from my perspective I, I'd always thought that that helped me through life not 
not being existentially worried about dying. Um, but to hear him say that he felt kind of guilty about it was interesting. Um, and I reassured him that I didn't think he should feel guilty about it. And I had sometimes thought, whenever I, whenever I think I know how I'm going to react to something bad happening, I'm always kind of quite close to right. Um, and so I, I've sometimes wondered when I'm on my deathbed, if I get warning, if it doesn't happen very abruptly, will I suddenly be really scared of dying? Will I suddenly be very alarmed by the idea um, when it's actually in front of me? And I think seeing him die and being with him while he thought he was probably going to die, um, it's reassured me that like everything else, that attitude does kind of carry on. Um, with him it carried on right up to his own death. He never seemed even remotely emotionally upset by the fact that he was about to die. Um, he had moments of concern for us, but I think broadly he knew that we'd be all right, so he didn't seem too stressed about that. Um, he seemed completely calm about the entire thing. I think that the actual process of dying, because he had liver cirrhosis and, and various other things, he became less and less cognizant of things. And he, he was clearly a bit agitated when he was actually dying uh, on, on the day of. Um, but I think that's just, it was almost a physiological reaction at that point with no, with no mind behind it. Um, but we had, we had moments where I was sitting in the hospital with him and he had this hepatic something or other, I can't remember what it's called, but it's something my, my great aunt also had when she had liver problems. And he was basically hallucinating a little bit and um, he said that he could see squiggly lines on the ceiling. Um, and at night they became more obvious. Um, and I thought that sounds kind of familiar. And, and we talked a little bit about it. Um, and the nurse had apparently said a lot of people with liver problems report similar things. And <clears throat> he had, when, when I was having, after, uh, shortly after I had these, these kind of my, minor delusions, I remembered back to him being in the bed and him having some kind of delusions about um, things because that's what liver problems, that, you know, they can cause delusions and hallucinations. And he, he would say things like, I think they were filming an episode of Black Mirror here last night. And I sort of went, what? What, in the hospital? And he went, yeah, well, I think, they, I think that guy opposite might be famous. And last night the, they were trying to stop the paparazzi taking pictures of him and everyone in the, you know, all the doctors in the corridor were doing were laughing and doing a play and and I I couldn't quite pin it down because he seemed to be he seemed to be saying these things quite seriously as if they were true as if he was telling me something interesting that had happened but when I asked what do you mean he, he seemed to have a slight inkling that what he was saying didn't make sense and he seemed to sort of try to find another way of wording it that did make sense, almost as if he knew there was something underlying it, but he, he wasn't wording it right. Um, and for me, it was weird because it was, I knew that, that this kind of thing is possible from, from the neuroscience degree. I knew that when people's brains are not working properly, they can behave in some ways completely normally and in other ways very confusingly. Um, and in hindsight, I think that's what it was. He was just having quite realistic delusions about things. Um, but I felt this kind of connection with him at times when I didn't completely understand reality. And I thought, you know, being on the cusp of death, I think is always presented as this profoundly dramatic um, thing, which is completely unlike all, you, all the rest of your life. And it's the most dramatic, important moment of your whole life. And you're always wondering, when will it come? Will I die well? Will it be, you know, will everything be in place? Will all the right people be around me? And I think, as other things have already kind of primed me to feel, of course, in reality, it just happens when it happens. And whoever's around you is around you. And it happens in whatever way it happens. And then afterwards, people deal with it. And it's, it's the experience of dying is not necessarily that different to the experience of 
living. Um, and I suppose it's just almost just interesting how it will end up happening. I suppose it, it, it makes it makes me feel every time it happens, it makes me a lot less scared of it. Um, I think I went from talking about connection to talking about death, fear of death, but I don't know. I, I might stop there just because I think I'm rambling a bit now, but I I hope that anybody else going through a bit of a difficult time can feel some kind of connection with somebody else who who has recently been going through a difficult time. I hope this has some positive effect on somebody. And I hope that the descriptions of, um, of cognitive issues are at least a little bit interesting. Uh, I don't claim to have, have, have experienced like the depths of dementia or anything like that. Um, I don't think anybody who had could, could talk about it, but um, yeah, I suppose it's the kind of video that I'd be interested in watching. Um, so it's, it's worth putting up on that basis. But yeah, thank you very much for watching and I'll talk to you soon.